Well, welcome back to the Broad Oak Piety Podcast. Uh, this is Ryan sitting here once again with Joey. And uh, today we actually have uh, a special guest with us. Uh, Joey is a good friend of mine and, and Jeff is a good friend of mine. And I, I always love getting my friends together. Um, and This is uh, the first time I've gotten together with this good friend of yours. Yes, I know. I know. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's good to uh, connect, even though we're connecting through Zoom. But uh, it's, it's good to connect. Uh, this is uh, my friend, Jeff Riddle, uh, Dr. Jeff Riddle. He is uh, a pastor. Brother, just uh, welcome to the podcast and just tell our listeners just maybe a, a few things about you. Hey, uh, thank you, Ryan. And thank you, Joey. It's nice to be a guest uh, here on the podcast. I appreciate the invitation. So I am a pastor, Reformed Baptist pastor. I'm the pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. Um, I've been in that congregation for about 12 years. I've been in the ministry for about 30 years. I was uh, formerly a Southern Baptist before I became a confessional Reformed Baptist and was for a short t period of time was a missionary in Hungary uh, right after the fall of communism and then came back and ministered in uh, a couple of Southern Baptist churches before I sort of uh, came to Reformed Baptist convictions and uh, so anyways, I've been serving in this church and enjoying the ministry there. And uh, I married to my wife, Llewellyn, been married over 30 years, and we have uh, five children, and um, three of them are out of the home, two are in, in high school. And uh, so uh, we're enjoying life here in Central Virginia and ministering in our church and also, I, I teach adjunctly at a couple places at Piedmont Virginia Community College, and I've taught for uh, the IRBS Seminary, also a class on the Gospels. And uh, here recently, I've done quite a bit of ministry related to uh, the Doctrine of Scripture, um, to Bibliology, and so that's kind of a, an, an interest of mine. Yeah. Well, brother, it is it is good to have you on. and part of the reason that we wanted to have you on today is, is as it relates to what you just said, part of the doctrine of scripture. Um, and uh, our listeners who've been listening with us for a while, we've talked about this in previous episodes uh, once or twice. We, we even had an episode where we talked about uh, a particular text in the gospel of Mark. But what we wanted to do today, uh, brother, is just ask you your thoughts um, on another particular passage from the Gospel of John. And in our English Bibles, it, it would be listed as John 7.53 through chapter 8.11. This is the story of the woman caught in adultery. Uh, academically, this might be called the pericope adulteri. Um, but just scanning our English versions, um, for instance, in the uh, New American Standard Bible, there's a footnote that says that this passage, quote, is not found in most of the old manuscripts, end quote. Or uh, if you pull, for instance, the English Standard Version off the shelf, actually the Study Bible goes further than the note. The English Standard Version Study Bible says in one of its notes on this passage, it says, quote, uh, there is considerable doubt that this story is a part of John's original gospel, for it is absent from all of the oldest manuscripts, but there is nothing in it unworthy of sound doctrine. It seems best to view the story as something that probably happened during Jesus's ministry, but that was not originally part of what John wrote in his gospel. Therefore, it should not be considered as part of scripture and should not be used as the basis for building any point of doctrine unless confirmed in scripture, end quote. Um, mm. Yeah, I've, I mean, I've got the, the NASB opened as well, particularly the MacArthur Study Bible. And there's a there's a footnote in here in, where MacArthur says this section dealing with the adulteress most likely was not a part of the original contents of John. And he says um, external manuscript evidence, even representing a great variety of textual traditions is decidedly against its inclusion. For the er not just the earliest, but also he says the best manuscripts exclude it. Many manuscripts mark the passage to indicate doubt to its inclusion, which we would see the brackets in our various modern translations. And then he goes on to say that no Greek church father comments on this passage until the 12th century. Um, 
been sown. Yeah. And, and just uh, one last reference. Uh, I think this is probably, if a Bible is going to have footnotes, uh, this one is probably the most fair that I've seen. The version that I, I regularly use, the New King James Version, says this. Uh, it, it has uh, various initials that it uses for various underlying Greek texts. So it's referencing the modern critical text here. It says, the modern critical text, quote, brackets 753 through 811 as not in the original text. They are present in over 900 manuscripts of John. And I, and I think, end quote, I think that's a little bit more of a fair representation, perhaps, of the data. But Brother, you've done a lot of work, and I want to go on record as saying, I, I know you, but, but we are comfortable. I, I would be very comfortable preaching this passage as the Word of God, saying it is Scripture, but you've done a lot of work in this area. When, when a, a listener opens their Bible, whatever English version it may be, and they read notes like this, what, what are they to think? And, and is, this, is this a fair representation of uh, the full reality of this text? So let me just start there. Your thoughts? Well, it's a great, it's a great question. And I think um, for many ordinary Christians, when you, when you open your Bible and you're reading through uh, your Bible and you're wanting to understand God's word, uh, you wanted to comprehend it, um, you may have the idea that, you know, you're going to go seek out a Bible translation. And a lot of times you're going to maybe choose the translation that's used in your church or, or something like that. And a lot of times people, maybe they start reading the Bible and maybe their grandmother gave them the King James Version or something like that. And they start reading and it's hard, it's hard to understand. And so uh, somebody suggests, why don't you get a modern translation? The wording is a little bit different. You can understand it's a little more accessible. And so they get a modern translation. They start reading it. But sometimes people have the, the wrong idea that modern versions are only about updating the language. Right. And um, I would encourage anybody who has a Bible, whatever Bible you use, read the front matter. There's usually a page or two. Um, it's not long. Read it and the editors, translators will explain to you um, how they came to do this translation. They'll talk about what underlying text they use and what translation philosophy they use. So anyways, with Bibles, Really, one of the key things is the underlying text that's underneath the translation. Because if you're reading in English, of course, the Bible was originally written in the Old, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and the New Testament was written in Greek. There are a few small parts of the Old Testament written in Aramaic, which is a Semitic cognate language, but most of it's in classical Hebrew. And if you can read classical Hebrew, you can understand the Aramaic parts. <laughs> Anyways, New Testament is written in Koine Greek. And then, uh, of course, it was translated into various languages from the very beginning. It was in the early days, translated into Latin or into Syriac or into Coptic. And then beginning uh, in the 16th century, it begins to be translated into English. William Tyndale's first person to translate the New Testament from the Greek into English. And then his translation had huge influence on the family of English translations, we might say. But anyways, um, for a long time, most, pe most translations of the Bible were based on what we, we would know as a traditional underlying text. But beginning in the 19th century and on into the 20th century, there arose a modern critical text that was different than the traditional text. And many modern translations are not based on the old traditional original language text, but they're based on this modern critical text. And so when you're reading through your Bible uh, and you get, you're in the book of Acts and you get to Acts chapter eight, verse 37. In a lot of modern Bibles, uh, like the NIV, the ESV, in the text proper, it's gonna skip from Acts eight thirty-six to Acts eight thirty-eight. And you're going to be like, wait a second, where's verse 37? If you look in the footnote, you'll find Acts 8.37 in most of those modern translations. And it's the confession of the Ethiopian eunuch. I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. But there'll be a note there saying that in some ancient manuscripts, this verse doesn't appear. 
And so that verse is now relegated to the footnotes in many modern translations. That would be an example of a difference, a textual difference that influences the translation. Now, personally, I believe Acts 8.37 is original to Acts. I think it's part of the text proper. I think it should be there in the text. And it, as it does appear in translations based on the traditional text, like the King James Version, and also there are modern translations based on the traditional text, like the New King James Version, the, the modern English version, the MEV, which has come out more recently. Um, but most modern translations are based on the modern critical text. And that's why you see differences. So a Bible is not just a matter of updating the words or the wording, but it's really a matter of what underlying text did the translators choose to use. And one last thing, and then we, we can continue the conversation. For someone who's really interested in this, there, there's an organization in England that's called the Trinitarian Bible Society that is dedicated to promoting the traditional text. And they have a free um, PDF that you can find, and it's called the Textual Key to the New Testament. If you just Google Trinitarian Bible Society um, Textual Key, uh, it's a little free PDF. You can print it out if you want a hard copy of it. And it lists 650 differences in the text between the traditional text and what you'll find in modern translations. We and can so, put that in the show notes for people yeah. to access too. So we'll do that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good resource for people who are... And if you, if you use the New King James Version, as I think Ryan does... You know, that, that translation is very helpful, too. That translation has the most information about text criticism of any modern English translation. It has a lot of information, and, and it'll provide for you, you know, uh, the, it'll, make, it'll tell you in the notes, you know, what the, the, the modern critical text reads at a certain point. It uses the abbreviation NU to stand for Nestle, Aland, and United Bible Societies. And then it'll it'll tell you what the traditional text says. So, anyways, um, so that's just a little orientation that the Bible, the translation of the Bible is not just about updating the wording, but it's about what is the underlying text upon which the translation is based. And whatever translation you have you you choose to use, that's something you ought to know. You know, uh, you ought to know if you're you know what the the text is that you, that underlies the translation you choose to use no that's helpful brother and you know as we as we think about the differences in these underlying texts we could have another whole episode that, that orientation is so clear and so helpful we could have another whole episode on what we mean by traditional text versus modern critical text some of our listeners might be thinking well what why why was there a modern critical text and we can put in the show notes i think joey you and i did an episode last year where i where we kind of talked through those those differences and so we can highlight highlight that but as we as we get to john 7 53 through 8 11 the woman caught in adultery that is a precious story that the average person who's under the age of or who's over the age of probably 30 uh, grew up in church hearing and, and listening and, and revering, um, there is a difference because the modern critical text doesn't usually include that as a part of its manuscript base, and therefore the English translations based on that modern critical text don't include it, although most of the versions still put it in there, which is another mm. ironic reality. But um, They bracket it. Yeah, they, they bracket it. Uh, they call it not the word of God, essentially, but still leave it in, which is kind of interesting. Um, but, brother, wh why should we consider that passage a part of the word of God? And I know that you could probably give a brief orientation as to what we mean when we say internal evidence versus external evidence. But what are some just some reasons why we should we should continue to hold to that as part of the word of the living God? Can well, we like, frame it? I'm sorry to interrupt. Could we could we frame it, Ron, just so that the listeners, I think, can follow along more accurately? Dr. Riddle, if you wouldn't mind doing internal evidence and then and and then give the category of external evidence and work there. I don't know if that's how you were about to answer the question, but um, 
just for clarity's sake, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, let me, let me just, just the first observation, as you said, if you pick up a modern translation, um, it'll often have John 7, 53 through 8, 11 there, printed there in the text proper, but it'll be put in brackets and there'll be a note suggesting that, that perhaps it's not original. And then if you have a study Bible, you know, the ESV study Bible or even MacArthur study Bible, they may have notes suggesting that uh, this passage isn't part of the original text of John, it, perhaps even saying it shouldn't be preached on and so forth. So, but it's a beloved passage. It's, it's, it's one that many non-Christians know. If you, if you were to talk to them about what, you're, what did Jesus say, there's a good chance they're going to they're gonna paraphrase uh, John 8, 7. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Actually, in the authorized version, it says, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And so that's one of the best known Bible verses. Of course, it's often taken out of context and abused to, to say you can't ever judge anybody for anything. And just like people love to take Matthew 7, 1 out of context, judge not lest you be judged. That's not what actually Matthew 7, 1 is talking. It's, it's talking about don't uh, judge hypocritically. Don't judge unless you're willing to be judged by the same standard. And similarly, al although a lot of people remember, let he was without uh, sin cast the first stone, they forget how the, this passage ends with Christ saying to the adulterous woman, go and sin no more. So it's a very powerful story. It's a very powerful account of, uh, the, of a part of Christ's ministry. And so it's a beloved passage. And I think part of the reason why in many modern versions they haven't taken it out of the text proper is they fear a backlash. Uh, because I think generations of Christians have said, we hear in this story the voice of our shepherd. We, we, we hear in this, and it's been meaningful to many people. How many pastors have taken this passage when we've counseled with somebody who's fallen into grievous sin, and we've asked them to read it, and we've explained to them that there is forgiveness uh, for great sins through a great Savior, through Christ. But we've also at the end said, okay, but, you know, you've been granted the grace of forgiveness if you repent of your sin and, uh, and you express, express genuine sorrow. But now there's an expectation also that you go and sin no more, that there be growth and sanctification. So it's a beloved account. And again, most people in the pew I think would, would protest vehemently if this passage were removed because the sheep hear the voice of their shepherd. So that's just a general orientation as to, you know, I think how most people in the pew look at this passage. And it might be confusing for many to say, well, wait a second, what do you mean this isn't part of the passage? Now, that suggestion comes from academic study of the text through modern textual criticism. And when modern text critics study the text of scripture, they often talk about, as, as already mentioned, the external evidence versus the internal evidence. By external evidence, really what we're talking about is looking at the extant manuscript evidence, the existing ancient manuscripts we have of the New Testament, of the Gospel of John, of this passage in particular. And what, does, what do those manuscripts say? Do they include this passage or they, do they not include it? And then internal evidence is, the, is, is laying aside the question of the manuscripts. Does this passage fit within the narrative of John? Does the language, does the theology fit with what scholars would say is Johannine? the adjective that's used to describe things associated with the writings of John the Apostle. And so we have, we, so we talk about the Johannine corpus of the New Testament, which would include the Gospel of John, the three epistles of John, and the book of Revelation. Uh, you know, is it consistent with Johannine theology, Johannine vocabulary, etc.? So that so that's really what we're talking about. So I can go. You 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 suggested you want you wanted me to start with the internal evidence first. You said rather, oh rather, either either one. I was just saying okay. 
uh, whenever we're in those categories, I, you given those definitions, I think is helpful for a listener who this may be the first time they're ever hearing um, anything about, you know, this issue. And as you said, would even be shocked that there is a question uh, that the woman caught in adultery would be received in the canon of scripture or not. So, I, you know, I, I think we have some listeners that this is brand new yeah, information. Yeah. I so, understand. Yeah. Well, let me just let me just begin with. Uh, I think usually it's help. It's probably more helpful to begin with the external evidence, and that is to say, okay, let's look at the manuscripts. And I'm, let me just just generally say that um, you know sometimes you'll hear apologists say we have over five thousand manuscripts in the New Testament. We have more than any other um, ancient work of ancient literature, and that's true. We have a lot of extant manuscript evidence for the New Testament. But a lot of those 5,000 manuscripts that we have are actually fragments, only parts. Some are only a verse or two. Um, most of the, the, the more extended manuscripts we have are much later in time. In truth, we don't have a lot of early manuscript evidence from the New Testament. And there's a reason for that. It's because the early church was persecuted. And a lot of, uh, of the early manuscripts were destroyed. Uh, and a lot of it is just the wear and tear of time. So there aren't actually as many early manuscripts as we might think there are. Now, when we look at, at this passage, and we, and we have copies of the Gospel of, of, of John, um, it, this passage appears in, and I'm using uh, figures here that come from Maurice Robinson, who was a research professor at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. And I'm also using some information here from my friend James Snap Jr., um, who is an advocate for what's called the majority text. But this passage appears in 1,502 Greek manuscripts that include John 7 and 8. So 1,502. However, it is missing in 267 manuscripts. So it's in the majority of New Testament manuscripts. It's called a majority text reading. It's only a minority of manuscripts that do not have this passage. Wilbur Pickering is another uh, majority text advocate. He points out in his writings on, on this passage that the, 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 this passage, the woman taking adultery, uh, appears in 85% uh, uh, of the extant manuscripts. It's, it's missing in 15%. Now, okay, you say, well, let's look at the earliest manuscripts. What about the earliest ones? Maybe the earlier ones are better. Um, if we go and look, we look at the earliest manuscripts, they're really, they're really, I, I'm going to look at the ones that are the, the five oldest that are most often cited. Of the five oldest manuscripts that we have that are called unsealed manuscripts uh, uh, of the Greek New Testament, two of them omit the Pericope Adulteri. They are Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. And they were the two heavyweights that had the most influence on modern textual criticism. Two of the earliest are damaged at this point in the manuscript. And so they don't provide evidence for or against. That's Codex Alexandrinus and uh, Codex C or O4, as it's called. It's also uh, called Ephraim Rescriptus. But it's damaged there, and so it, it doesn't provide any evidence. Then... It appears in Codex D or Codex Bezai. So the five earliest, missing in two, damaged in two, so it doesn't tell us yay or nay, and present in one, in D. Now, to be, to be absolutely fully transparent, and I'm not afraid of any evidence you know, regarding this passage, I, I defend its authenticity, it is also missing in two early, what are known as papyri manuscripts. 
P66 and P75, bottom or papyri. But P75 is very similar to Vaticanus. So they really represent one sort of stream, I think, that's represented in Sinaiticus and Vaticanus uh, that, that exclude it. Um, so that's really the, that's the sum of the earliest evidence. And, 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 and what we do know for sure is that there was controversy about this, this passage. So we don't, we'll talk about that hopefully in a moment. There was controversy about it. And when a passage was controversial, then, you know, there were some people maybe who wanted to remove it from the text, wanted to suppress it, while others wanted to defend it and include it. Now, again, it does appear in Codex Bezai, which is from the 5th century. It also appears in a number of other early, what are called unsealed manuscripts, um, and that includes uh, manuscripts E, F, H, K, U, and Gamma. And those are from the, the, the 8th, 9th, and 10th centuries. And so um, it, 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 it does appear in those ancient unsealed manuscripts. And again, it's the majority reading. It's the, it becomes the consensus reading, we could say, of Christianity, uh, according to the, the extant manuscript evidence that we have. And we also, it, we know it was, it's, it, although it, it may be the earliest manuscript, existing manuscript we have may, may only be from the fifth century, but we have a lot of evidence, citations, references to it in earlier literature, um, including in versional evidence, early translations. And one of those is Jerome. Jerome was a church father and in the fourth century, fifth century, he um, is responsible for the Latin Vulgate and the Pericope Adulteri or the woman taking adultery is included in the Latin Vulgate. So um, anyways, so there, there's lots of early evidence externally for, for this passage, and it is the majority text reading. It's the, cons we could call it the consensus reading of Christianity. Um, it's really only been <clears throat> in the, in, since the 19th century that it's been excluded from Protestant Bibles. Um, the early reformers accepted it. You can read John Calvin's commentary on um, this passage, and he affirms it. So the, this was affirmed in the, uh, by the reformers and by the early Protestants in all the translations, not just in English, but in all the the modern languages of Europe, when they translate the Bible into their languages, Hungarian, Spanish, Dutch, the passage was there. There were no brackets around it. It was simply received as a text. We only have begun to have these brackets in the 19th century. Um, so that's the that's the external evidence. So let me just let me just pause there before I go on to the internal evidence. And do you have a question or or a comment on this? No, I, that was very helpful, brother. Um... And I think um, I'd love for you to take just a second and talk about the controversy that you mentioned, because I think that controversy um, also gives rise to some further external evidence, not necessarily manuscript evidence, but early church father evidence um, that's helpful. You mentioned a controversy. Could you take maybe just a minute or so and talk about what that controversy was and, and sort of what that evidence, the discussion among at least one particular church father means for this, this uh, debate. Yeah. So as, as I said, there was controversy about this passage. We'll readily, we'll readily admit that and concede that. Um, there, there are two passages in the New Testament that there was controversy, major controversy. One was the ending of Mark. One was this passage. And um, why was this passage controversial? Well, we have the Lord Jesus Christ forgiving a woman who had broken the moral law of God, who was taken in adultery. And, and when we, we, we're sort of in our, in our contemporary evangelical circles, take forgiveness of sin, you know, as almost for granted. But this is really striking that a woman was forgiven by Christ of adultery. And so, um, again, this was, this was controversial. 
And, and so we know it was controversial because there are early church fathers who talk about the fact that it was controversial. Ambrose of Milan uh, quoted the passage at least nine times, and in a letter that he wrote dated to the year 372, he explained that it was omitted by some in his day because, quote, the teaching could be mistakenly interpreted as being too lenient for the sin of adultery, possibly even making Jesus to appear to make a mistake. So Ambrose, fourth century, knew that people were attempting to suppress this passage because they were offended by it. Augustine of Hippo, the great North African theologian, uh, wrote and made reference to the Pericope Adulteri in his exegesis, and he wrote commentary upon it. In the year 400, uh, in a work called De Adulterinus Conjugas, um, he wrote the following. Certain persons of little faith, or rather enemies of the true faith, fearing, I suppose, lest their wives should be given impunity in sinning, remove from their manuscripts the Lord's act of forgiveness toward the adulteress, as if he who had said sin no more had granted permission to sin. So Augustine, 400, is saying, I know people, some people are removing this because they're offended by this act of forgiveness. Now, there's not only that sort of ethical angle, but also church historians will tell us that there was a big controversy going on in the fourth century among early Christians. It's called the Novation Controversy. And there was a problem with some Christians who had lapsed under persecution. And there was a debate as to whether or not persons who had denied Christ should be readmitted to the church. And some of these people who had denied Christ during the Novation Controversy, um, they were accused of being adulterers. They had committed spiritual adultery. And, and there's a sense in which also this, this passage may have been controversial because it had become part of the debate. There was a Spanish church father named Patian or Pacian writing in the late fourth century who protested the severity of the Novationists who uh, were not wanting people who had lapsed from the faith under the stress of persecution to be readmitted to the church. And he argued against them by appealing to this passage, by appealing to John 7, 53 through 8, 11. And he wrote the following in an epistle. He said, are you not willing to read in the gospel that the Lord also spared the adulteress who confessed, whom no man had condemned? And so it might have been controversial ethically. It also might have been a controversial ecclesiologically. And so there were reasons why it may have, there may have been attempts to suppress it. We don't, we don't deny it was controversial. But what we see is that eventually, uh, we could say Christendom came to a consensus that this was authentic and should be affirmed. And that spanned East and West in the end. I'm sorry, yeah. I took a lot of time on that one. No, that's good. Could I ask just a quick question on that issue as it relates to it being a controversy? You mentioned it's perhaps it was an ecclesi ecclesiastical controversy, ethical controversy, but the controversy wasn't necessarily surrounding the authenticity of those being included in the canon of scripture. Right. Yeah. It was a it, well, I mean, there it was about authenticity because I guess the people who uh, didn't like the passage thought it was inconsistent with with what they believe what they held to to be would have been the views of Jesus. But what you're saying is what was driving that, however, was um, not that it wasn't in the earlier manuscript. Correct. Yes. But that it was controversial in ethical application or ecclesiological application gotcha. in their times. Yeah. Yeah, that's gotcha. a great point. That's a good point, Joey. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, from, from what you've just told us, brother, it sounds like, I mean, and I, I don't want to uh, exaggerate this claim, but it sounds like what we have is we have equally old evidence of the authenticity and discussion and assumption that it is in, in the texts of Scripture, uh, as we do for evidence that is 
to the contrary. And, and we have evidence that is in a, a, a wide range of, of uh, Chris, Christendom, so to speak, and in, in an overwhelming majority of manuscripts. Now, I, I know there's a lot that could be nuanced in what I just said, but that kind of discussion, I think, is important, and I think it's missing in a lot of the brief footnotes that a lot of modern English version uh, Bibles will have. And, 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 and that's nothing against modern translations as much as it is the underlying text. Yeah. Let's, it's heavy-handed one way. Yeah. You know, so as we think about internal evidence, uh, you gave us that definition earlier as to what internal evidence is. There's a lot we could say about what uh, you've just said, and perhaps listeners may have questions there, but it was very, very helpful looking at external evidence. What, what, do, you, what do you think about when you think of the internal evidence for this particular passage of Scripture? Yeah, well, I think the, the place to begin probably is, is the narrative flow of John 7 and 8. And so, you know, one question you might ask if you're just looking at your Bible and you're looking at, at John chapter 7 and 8 is the question is, if I were to remove John 7, 53 uh, through 8, 11 from the text, would it interrupt the narrative flow? And of course, John 7, uh, the setting for this is uh, Christ going up for the, the Feast of Tabernacles. And so he's there for the Feast of Tabernacles. And in John 7, 37, um, it says, in the last day, that great day of the Feast, Jesus stood and cried, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Um, now, again, those who think that this passage is not authentic, they would remove the passage and we would go from John 7, 52 to John 8, 12. And that's the way the passage, they would suggest that it was originally. And I think there are some problems with that. Um, if, if you're looking at John 7 and 8, when you get to John 7, 45, it sort of transitions from Christ speaking on the last day of the feast to the officers uh, uh, coming to the chief priests and Pharisees. And the, the chief priests and Pharisees ask, why have ye not brought him? Why didn't you arrest Jesus? And they're having this conversation. And then Nicodemus enters into the conversation in verse 50. Nicodemus saith unto them, uh, he that came to Jesus by night being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? So if you accept 753 through 811, it brings about an ending. It brings about an ending to the day. Uh, verse 53, and every man went unto his own house. Jesus went, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came to the temple. It ends the day and starts a new day, and it's, it's on the morning of the new day, the day after the Feast of Tabernacles that this woman is brought to, to, to Christ. But if it's not there, we go from this conversation between uh, the officers with the chief priests and Pharisees and Nicodemus speaking, and then look, then look at chapter 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them. Where did he come from? He sort of appears out of the narrative you know, uh, out of nowhere with, with one of the I am sayings, I am the light of the world. So I think that's a narrative problem. There's a fellow named John David Punch who wrote a doctoral dissertation at a, at a university in the Netherlands on the Pericope Adulteri. He also points out that if John 7, 53 through 8, 11 is not original and it's, and it's not there, it creates a problem because this would be, as, as I think he put it, the longest day in John's narrative. He says, if the pericope adulteri is removed, this would become, quote, the longest single day and discourse recorded in the New Testament, certainly in the Gospel of John. So I think there's a lot of narratological reasons as to why the passage is appropriate there. Now, another thing beyond narrative would be the question of the vocabulary. And sometimes you'll hear people say, 
You know, credentialed New Testament scholars, they'll say, well, John 7, 53 through 8, 11, it can't be original because the language, the vocabulary, the style doesn't fit with the Gospel of John. And a lot of times, these kinds of judgments are based on subjective opinions. That's right. And I think there could be a, a lot of argument that, that could be made for the authenticity of the passage, how it fits with jo John's usage. Now, let, let me, and I don't, I don't want to be too tedious, um, but let me just give you a couple of examples of this. One of the things when, when some modern scholars look at this passage, one of the things they cite is, there's too much what they call synoptic language in this passage. So for example, there's a mention uh, in chapter eight, verse one of the Mount of Olives. That's the only mention of the Mount of Olives in the Gospel of John. Get your concordance, look it up. It's the only place it appears. Also in verse three, it says, and the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him, unto him a woman taken adultery. This is the only place in John's gospel where there's a reference to the scribes. Okay, the scribes are mentioned in Matthew, Mark, Luke. Mount of Olives is mentioned in Matthew, Mark, Luke. And so they say, aha, this shows somebody wrote this who, you know, wasn't John. But there's a problem with that. Because if you read through all of John, what you find is actually in the gospel of John um, that John often uses terms that you find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke in a sparing manner. And again, this maybe gets more complicated. Many believe that John was the last of the Gospels written. We, Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a lot of similarities with each other. John, in many ways, stands out as being something quite unique. He describes a lot of things that don't appear in the other Gospels. But anyways, Sometimes he will refer to things that are very common in the, in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but in a sparing kind of way. For example, um, in John's gospel, John never uh, describes or gives us a list of the 12 apostles. Matthew does, Mark does, Luke does. John doesn't have a list of the 12 but he knows that there were 12 apostles. The term in Greek is the dodeca. He knows there were the 12, the dodeca. And uh, in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 67, chapter 6, verse 70, chapter 6, verse 71, he refers to the dodeca. But he does so sparingly, and he never provides a list. Another example of uh, an interesting thing about the Gospel of John is if you've read the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John actually never refers to John the Apostle by name. It talks about John the Baptist, refers to John the Apostle as the beloved disciple, but never refers to him by name. Whereas in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John is identified alongside of his brother as the sons of Zebedee, James and John of Zebedee. But in John's Gospel, uh, John is, is not mentioned by, directly by name. He's called the beloved. I think it's because he's the author, right? Um, but there's one reference to the sons of Zebedee, John 21, 2. So terms that are used more frequently in the Synoptic Gospels are used more sparingly in John. I see the reference to the Mount of Olives and the scribes as actually evidence of it being consistent with Johannine style, if that makes sense. Um, let me, and uh, uh, another thing is, I think if you look at um, this passage, you actually find a lot in John 7 to 53 through 8 11 that is completely consistent with what you find in the rest of John's gospel. And I, I mentioned I did a talk at Metropolitan Tabernacle Church um, in London last November on this passage. And in that talk, I listed seven examples of places where the, the language, the style in John 7, 53 through 8, 11 are consistent with what we find in the rest of the Gospel of John. Let me just give, cite two examples of this. Um, in, in John 8, verses 9 and 10, the adulterous woman is referred to by the Greek term, he gene the woman, the woman. So there's a 
a definite article, hey, and then this term, gene, the woman. And um, if, you, if you go back in John's gospel and you look at John chapter four, Jesus meets with the Samaritan woman at the well. It's interesting, it's another scene where the Lord Jesus is meeting with a woman with a questionable moral background. And guess what the, the, the Samaritan woman, guess how she's referred to in John 4 as hey, gene, the woman. John 4, 9, John 4, 11, John 4, 15, John 4, 17, John 4, 19, John 4, 25, John 4, 28. What is more, the Samaritan woman refers to the Lord Jesus as Lord, using the word kurios, but it's in the vocative, kurie. Lord, three times, John 4, 11, John 4, 15, John 4, 19. And if you look at the, the, the woman taking an adultery passage in John 8, 11, the adulterous woman refers to Jesus as Kyrie, as Lord. It's consistent with Johannine usage. And also the second example, if, if you look at John 8, 11, the passage that I mentioned earlier as being, you know, one that, that, People often forget to mention the final word that Christ says to this woman is go and send no more. And in Greek, uh, it uses a negative particle, meketi, and then uh, the verb, an imperative, hamartane, send no more. Okay. Now, if you go back in John's gospel and you look at John chapter 5, and there's an account there of the Lord Jesus healing the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. And he later finds this man in the temple. And if you look at John chapter 5, verse 14, the second half of verse 14, Christ says to this man, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. And that the phrase that's rendered there is sin no more, is meketi hamartane. It's exactly the same phrase used in John 8, 11. So my point is, I've looked at it, I've, I've read it in Greek. There's nothing inconsistent with the language, the style, the vocabulary that we find in uh John 7, 53 through 8, 11, and what we find in the rest of John, which is accepted as authentic. Let me just, let me just add one more thing uh, on the narrative level. If, if we include the passage uh, there, as I think it should be, and you keep reading through, through John 8, notice how John 8 ends in verse 59. Then they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them and so passed by. John, John's gospel, if you're familiar with it, is filled with irony. There's a lot of irony in it. And think about the irony of a sinful woman is about to be stoned to death and Christ forgives her. And then you get to the end of John 8, and a sinless Christ is threatened with stoning, and he departs and walks through the midst of them. Well, that it just fits so beautifully. Yeah. The context of the Gospel of John. And I think it I think it does damage to the narrative flow of John to remove this passage. And I think that's been the consensus of. Of Christianity. I mean, this is it's always been a minority position to want to remove this passage from the scriptures. And I just think we need to offer some pushback and say, no, we, we're gonna hang on to this passage. We're, we're gonna we're gonna continue to receive it, we're gonna continue to read it, we're gonna continue to preach it um, as part of the text of the word of God. So, anyways, that's what that's a little summary on the on the internal evidence. Yeah, that's excellent. I, as a pastor, one of the things that's unsettling to me is that we would be in the minority of, of preachers that would not preach this passage in the pulpit. Um, that, yeah. that, uns that unsettles me. 
you, you say it's, it unsettles you to think that, that maybe the minority of evangelical pastors today would, would be willing to preach it? Is that what you're saying? No, it unsettles me that when we think about all of Christendom, oh. that with, with where we are now, um, uh, with with the debate being should this be included in the canon of scripture or not that we would have pastors today that would not preach this as the canon of scripture and even be out of step because this I, i'm with you i mean this sounds exactly like christ and it's in it and it sounds just like the way john would orchestrate this narrative um mm. and and to to be willing to stand with something as new as the 19th century um uh, and, and say that that we're not gonna we're not gonna preach this as can, as the canon of scripture to mm. to stand with such a new idea and to stand with such a minority of all of christendom yeah. that that's what's unnerving to me now, I, I do want to say, you know, it, it, there was controversy about the passage, and it, it, it tended to be more widely accepted in the Western world. And you, you, I think you, you, you had a quote earlier from someone saying it wasn't mentioned in the Greek fathers till later, yeah. later on. And it was more controversial definitely in early on in the East. Although I think I mentioned this earlier, there was a fellow named you know, Didymus the Blind in Alexandria who um, makes reference to the passage in the fourth century. So there were Greek speaking Christians and obviously, and then eventually, like I said, it became the consensus. And if you look at, you know, um, if you look at what's called the patriarchal text of the, of the Eastern Orthodox church, they accept this. And so sometimes, yeah, sometimes we think, you know, we're picking up our ESV Bible and we think this represents Christianity. You know what I mean? And yeah. um, actually it, it actually only represents uh a, a slice of Christianity, really the, pa the passage uh, is, has been most largely challenged among um, mainstream Protestants and some evangelicals. But, but I think- Do you it, think, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, 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 this is just, a, I mean, uh, my own question. Do, do you think that some of the, some of that is because the, the the academy that that's the translation the approaching translations and 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 what which manuscripts to use is it that it became increasingly in the hands of the academy and less under the authority of the church do you do you think that there's something to that i mean does that question make sense yeah, yeah, and I, I definitely, I definitely think that, yeah, the stewardship of the text of scripture is a big question, and you know, w when we've, you know, now it's the the stewardship of the Bible is has been largely by Protestants been placed in the hands of the academy, and um, I know sometimes people will push back and say, well, you know, a lot of the scholars who are working on this are Christians, and but but a lot of the evangelicals don't have as much influence in the stewardship of the of the scholarly text that's in the hands of of you know an institute that's in germany and the united bible societies and um i don't i don't think there are many uh you know evangelical scholars that have a lot of influence but again like i said many evangelical scholars are of the opinion that this passage should be rejected anyway but anyway it is a it, it is a complex issue and i don't mean to say Again, I think we need to be careful because we've got to be charitable. I, I think a lot of people don't have, you know, nefarious motivations, but I think maybe in some cases, you know, men of my generation who went to seminary and read Bruce Metzger's commentary, and, you know, you read your favorite modern commentaries, and there seems to be a consensus, and a lot of people haven't um, been, they haven't looked at the other side to see there is actually a credible defense for this passage. But again, I think it's, it's often been the people in the pew who have been the ones uh, who've been sort of the firewall to say, you know, we love this passage. This is the, we hear the voice of our shepherd. 
And so I think it's one of those places where the people in the pew have really kept the, this pass, this part, this passage in our scriptures. I think there are some people who would remove it completely. And there have been some modern printings of the Greek New Testament, including the Tyndall House Greek New Testament 2017, that does remove John 7:53 through 811 from the text proper, relegates it to the footnotes. But uh, again, I I that hasn't happened in any in any modern versions as yet. We may see that in the future. But you know, I, I always say if, if it is scripture, um, I think it is, and I wholeheartedly uh, defend it, affirm it. But you know, uh, it, it's, this back to preservation, right? If we if it is the word of God. It will prevail. God will keep his word. And um, even if there, we go through a period of time, I think this is, a, in my opinion, a blip on the radar screen, a period of time in which the passage is being challenged. I think if, if it is the word of God, it will prevail. And God's people will continue to make use of it. God's people will continue to hear the voice of their shepherd in it, etc. cetera. Yeah. And, and, you know, brother, um, as we wrap up here, I think for me where this issue became uh, very, very crucial was as a, as a pastor who preaches through books of the Bible. And, mm. you know, my, my own seminary training was largely uh, text criticism was absent, perhaps through fault of my own, through perhaps just the, the, the focus was kind of a modern critical text approach. And, you know, then when you're preaching through books of the Bible, and, and even through some of your influence, brother, it was helpful. But, you know, it is a weighty thing. Some, some of our listeners might be thinking, well, this is interesting, but it's very technical and it's, you know, how do we, th but as a man who has to preach the word of God, I, I either have to say from the pulpit, this is not the word of God directly or just kind of by implication, or I have to say, this is the word of God, thus saith the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. And it becomes very, very weighty for me. When, if I'm preaching through the book of John, it's not just a scholarly en enterprise. It becomes um, very, very crucial to have to say to a congregation of five people or 5,000 people, whatever, whatever it may be, receive the word of Christ, right? Mm. Particularly for those of us in the Reformed camp that would argue that the preaching of the word of Christ is the word of Christ to the people of Christ. And, and you, you referenced this, I think I did earlier, but you know, the, if you're a person like the three of us who uh, confess the the second London confession of faith, or maybe there's a listener who confesses the Westminster confession of faith. I mean, in, in chapter one, verse uh, or paragraph eight, there's that discussion about the doctrine of the preservation of scripture. And, and I'm sure there's a lot you'd love to say about that, that we could say about that. But, and you know, what I see a lot of times is people who try to address it are woefully unprepared to address it. <laughs> and, um, and they may, they, 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 they pass on things, wrong information about it. Um, so anyways, so you were, we were saying you were making a great point, Ryan. Yeah, and no, just, it, it becomes the weight of having to, 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 to make that, that claim. So it's, it's important for every believer, but particularly for the pastor to consider. And then if you confess the doctrine of the preservation of scripture, you know, from, from one of the reformation era, uh, English, um, kinds of confessions, which we would only confess because we see them as arising from scripture, then you have to ask yourself, what does that mean? Um, so I think this is a very helpful uh, discussion. Um, Joey, brother, do you have anything else? I don't. I mean, I, I, I think this was, I think the conversation is going to serve our readers well, or our listeners well. And, um, and so, I mean, Dr. Riddle, thank you so very much for being willing to kind of come on and, and walk us through this issue. It's yeah, and, and a significant and, issue. And Jeff, your your stuff has been helpful to me. I know helpful to many others. But if folks want to kind of engage more of what of the work you're doing, where where could they find you? Well, I have a blog which is jeffriddle.net, and I also have a YouTube channel which is called Word Magazine. And so I post podcasts uh, to the YouTube channel and also to sermonaudio.com. And I'm also on Twitter at Riddle1689. So those are, those are the ways to follow me and uh, get in touch with me. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, brother. That was very, very helpful. Thanks to our listeners. Um, 
And uh, Joey, Lord willing, uh, I guess I'll see you the next time uh, we record. Sounds good. Mm-hmm.